Welcome to my toilet tunnel seminar that's actually in the seminar room. Uh, this is the demo scene from a US perspective uh, and how I, after 35 years, am only now making it to Europe for the first time. Uh, I did start going to demo parties in 2016, uh, very early on in the demo scene, obviously. Uh, that's a joke for anyone watching this that doesn't get that. Uh, let's talk about why the US is different from Europe and maybe uh, answer, I, hopefully I can get through this fast enough that I can answer some questions that are unanswered, but uh, I did ask a lot of questions uh, on the Discord and to various seniors ahead of time, so hopefully I've covered the topic in my slides. Uh, first, I'll talk about me. Uh, I am Generation Mech, as I like to call it, or a, a Xennial or Xennial or whatever, uh, you know, after Generation X, uh, but before Millennials. Uh, I was your standard computer nerd that was bullied in grade school. Uh, and uh, I'm a chiptune tribute artist and game composer by trade. Uh, so you probably already heard that my handle is inverse phase, but if you don't, you know now. Uh, I am also a museum curator, docent, uh, collection sky manager, janitor, mini hats person at my museum, Bloop. This is a hobby. I work on it 84 hours a week. I should have done this the other way around where I get paid to do the museum and music as a hobby. Oops, I did it wrong. Uh, I have organized or helped staff three US parties. Uh, I've lived in at least five different states, more if you include my state of mind. Uh, and I'm trying to go vegan, I'm not very good at it. This is my first time in Europe, hooray. Uh, okay, so um, I think that it's important that maybe, I, I used to have this slide later uh, in my presentation, but we should talk about the computer development in the states. Uh, it's much more simple uh, than the complicated sort of European picture. You had a lot of different countries with a lot of different sort of uh, development speeds and adoption speeds of computers. But in the US, we had 8-bit mach uh, machines. They were very popular. But by the, uh, by the time the demo scene would hit uh, the US, 16-bit machines would already be dropping. And so we didn't really witness as much of an 8-bit demo scene in the US. Uh, so that's, that's a bit of a difference. So, and even though the Amiga and the ST are, you know, like from the States, uh, they were the backseat machines kind of, you know, like they, they definitely were not as popular. The, so the big rivalry was Mac versus PC. And there is no Mac demo scene really. Uh, sorry to the like one person that's written a Mac demo, uh, you know, but... Uh, uh, you know, the, so basically what anyone in the US knows of the demo scene uh, kind of begins with like second reality or something. Uh, we, you know, we would go back and try to watch other demos for other platforms, but it would be probably after discovering a PC demo, I think. Uh, so let's talk about my background, which there are many slides because I think that my story uh, is perhaps unique to most, uh, like, or different from most Europeans. Uh, discovering the scene, but also it's kind of interesting that you'll see a lot of parallels in the way other Americans uh, would discover the scene in the States. Uh, so, um, you know, you, I was first reading at age two and programming and BBSing at age five. Um, my dad uh, got me a bunch of uh, here's how to learn English, you know, and grammar and whatever uh, games when I was two and realized that I could read words. And so, uh, very accelerated path to using a computer. One day he sits me down at the computer and says, see, this computer can call other computers. Isn't that neat? Yes, it is. Uh, so first computer all to myself was the computer that he showed me that on. It was a compact portable. I got it around age nine. Um, and you know, I had seen some crack throws and wares and Commodore 64 stuff at my friend's house. Uh, but for me, it was mostly like PC speaker hacks uh, and things like that. And the first demo that I strongly remember is Cold Cut uh, from Ultra Force. Uh, so that was 1990. Uh, and then I saw Vector Demo very quickly after that was 91. So after that, I would quickly scour my local user groups and BBSs. Uh, and, uh, but, but I'm still stuck with a PC beeper uh, at that time. And uh, so I'm writing music in like <laughs> NML and music construction set and you know, whatever. So let's talk about the rest. Um, I went to a computer show, uh, which is, you know, I mean, do they have computer shows out here? You know, like, I guess you'd call them computer fairs. 
uh, you know, but just a place to go and buy parts and, you know, uh, trade, meet people, trade stuff, whatever. Uh, I built a 28620 and across from the booth where I'm building my first computer uh, is Software of the Month Club. Uh, does, ever, uh, does anyone know this? Uh, this is a shareware company, uh, one of those companies that you pay them $20 and they'll ship you 12 disks of shareware or something like that. Uh, they're largely hated on uh, by demo groups who would say, you know, you're selling our demos. Uh, but let me assure you uh, posthumously, because they're all dead now, uh, they didn't really make very much money off of it. It was mostly to literally pay a guy to sit in front of a du disk duplicator. Um, you know, it's not like they sold your demo. Well, maybe this happened in Europe, I don't know. But uh, in the U.S., no one made, you know, 5 10 $15 for selling a disk with, you know, like second reality on it or whatever. Or if they did, it was very uncommon. Uh, so um, anyway, the Software of the Month Club happened to have disks full of mods, and they'd also sell you a disk with Track Blaster 2.0 from uh, Fulcrum Sync on it. Uh, and uh, guess who's looking to purchase a sound card soon? Me. Uh, so I got one for Christmas, and it was over. Uh, I now have a 286 with a 2400 baud modem and CGA <laughs> and some stuff from Software of the Month Club. So I have the worst graphics in town. Uh, but I have a sound card, and so I feel like I'm king of the world. Also, I was much more into music than graphics, so that's fine. Um, so I ordered a bunch of discs of mods, uh, and even though I had CGA and Track Blaster, I don't know if anyone has used it, um, for 1991, it was released in March, I think, uh, one of the earliest PC mod players uh, has a nice uh, multi-band spectrum analysis. Uh, it has uh, all four scopes for all four channels and uh, you know, a combination scope. And all of this is possible on like a 286 at 10 megahertz or something like that. And considering the 286 had to mix the mod, uh, unlike the Amiga, I think that this is a pretty good achievement. He did a very good job with this. Um, so shit got real. Um, all of this happens uh, on this slide in roughly less than a year. Uh, you know, I discovered my caps lock key, and I turned it off. And now suddenly everyone thinks that I'm older and I'm allowed into special uh, BBS download sections. Um, you know, some of that is uh, illicit material, but some of it is also some of the best stuff on the board. I would see future crews Unreal for the first time. Uh, oh, <laughs> Unreal, huh? Shit's about to get real again, so now I see that, and I remember my mod disks, and I'm starting to connect the dots. Uh, I start calling and mailing mod authors. Uh, I have a, a very fond and strong memory of, uh, does anyone know Sidewinder? Uh, was in a bunch of groups, but uh, Megawatts was one. Uh, did a bunch of jungle and techno and rave stuff. Um, Sidewinder lived in Texas. Uh, and was very famous for putting his address and uh, phone number in the mods. So one day I just picked up the phone and called. And we talked for 30 minutes about, you know, pizza and Sega. And, uh, you know, I asked if I could, uh, I, I was like, listen, I want to order one of your CDs, but I don't want you to run out. And also, will you take a check from a 12-year-old? Um, you know, so that was kind of interesting. I also, uh, I wrote... Uh, a, st a very stupid letter to Format um, after hearing the uh, Format's Depeche Mode, Enjoy the Silence cover. Uh, and I was like, could you also cover these songs, please? And it was, <laughs> I was stupid. Uh, anyway, uh, I started calling BBSs all over the US and racked up a long distance bill and st started getting in trouble with my parents. Um, but uh, I also decided maybe a better way to do this would be to run my own board. Uh, I ended up with a few gigs of mods uh, online and, uh, and seen stuff. I'm still 12 or 13 years old here. Um, I went to CompUSA, which is a popular, it's, it's a very much like uh, the media market right here, um, and rediscovered Future Crew after having seen Unreal. Uh, I kind of forgot, and part of the reason, I, it, it wasn't, it's not like it's a forgettable demo, it's that I had CGA. I didn't have VGA, so I wouldn't go back and watch it uh, again and again. I would just, you know, I had seen it once at a friend's house or something like that. Uh, but finally, I'm standing at, uh, at CompUSA, 
um, which actually, I wonder if I can, this is, this is a picture from Circuit City, but, uh, you know, or uh, some of us call it Circuit Shitty. Uh, there, that's, that's a really bad, like, but that, it looks the same as across the street, right? Um, but there were, um, oops, no, I don't want you to go over there. So, um, I don't know if anyone, uh, again, first time in Europe, I don't know if anyone does this here. Uh, if you go to um, an auto parts shop or a place where you can buy a car stereo or whatever, do they have them all lined up with a button so you can try them out uh, and power them on and off? And you can also press another button for which speakers you want to try with this car stereo and that sort of a thing. Uh, they, they do that a lot in the US, but uh, CompUSA had a version of this for here is a computer which speakers would you like to buy with your computer or whatever for your, you know, and by the way, do you have a sound card yet? Maybe you should get one. Uh, and uh, I already had a sound card, so I was like, ooh, you know, subwoofer and satellite speakers. Uh, but what were they using to demo the computer? Of course, demos and mods, uh, because that's the best thing that they could do. So I, I don't know if the computer had, I think, the demo machine at CompUSA had a Sound Blaster 16 or something at some point. It was a Sound Blaster Pro when I first saw it, but I would go back uh, to this computer store because it was near my dad's house um, and visit it and saw Future Cruise, Second Reality. Finally, I, I started, uh, I got a computer with VGA or whatever. I asked the store clerk if I could copy the demo because there was like, where else am I gonna get these interesting things and you know that sort of thing. Unzip uh, Second Reality and start reading the info text. Oh, there's a new version of the Scream Tracker. I had Scream Tracker 2, uh, but I, uh, I wanted Scream Tracker 3, and I posted on a news group. But now I'm getting ahead of myself. Hold on. We need to go to the next slide. I would steal internet in, uh, access in any way I could. Uh, so hold on. Let's talk about the US phone system a little bit. Um, this might be repeated information for some of you, uh, sorry, but maybe this is interesting. I think uh, everyone here is a lot closer together, so calling another country uh, would be less of a big deal than uh, calling another country if you're in the US. No? Well, some people say yes, some people say no, so I think it depends on which country you were in. Um, so I'm, I'm saying for us in the US, it was a big deal if you called another country, it was very expensive. Uh, we wouldn't do it. Uh, and if it was easy for you, then guess what? It wasn't for us. <laughs> That's all. Um, so uh, in the U.S., by the time the demo scene is hitting the U.S., uh, most phone companies are not charging to complete a local call. Uh, so I know uh, one of my biggest conversations with everyone in Poland is how every time you would dial, you would have to pay. Um, and so this, this is not really, this, this did exist at one point in the US, but our phone system had evolved past this at this point. Uh, structure of a US phone number might be interesting to some. Uh, you know, uh, you've heard of this plus one thing. Uh, we, I don't know, again, because I'm unfamiliar with dialing in other countries, but we actually have to dial the one uh, for a lot of us. Uh, we don't anymore, but a lot of people still just do it because it's muscle memory. Uh, we have a three-digit area code for usually the state, but eventually the state would break up uh, into multiple area codes. Uh, but there's also still a hard boundary uh, for whatever state that you're calling. Um, 212 is New York City. You know, I can, uh, you, you learn these over time. I'm sure you've done this with your local calling area or whatever. Um, and then you have a seven-digit phone number. Uh, and previously, this would be neighborhood codes and five-digit numbers. Um, so like Baltimore, uh, where I live right now had BA, which is 22 on your phone if you look at the letters. And so you could say, I'm, I'm Baltimore 12345, and it would mean 2212345. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting sort of, that's, that's really old though. Um, so um, then we have calling areas. Um, so here's, this kind of gets interesting about how it would cost money uh, to call different regions. So our local region, Again, this would be uh, you know, by design uh, for your phone plan, but generally, uh, if it's 30 minutes or less away, uh, it's free to call. Um, if you lived in DC, for example, uh, the DC metro area is much larger 
So the phone company would offer a phone plan so that you could call like DC, Northern Virginia, and Southern Maryland, which is probably more like an hour to an hour and a half radius. And there would be like a phone plan for that. And again, this is, I'm, I'm giving you my experience. Uh, this would vary wildly across the U uh, US and uh, different phone companies would develop uh, you know, at different rates. So it could have been different somewhere else in the US. But uh, so then you had regional long distance. Uh, this is, uh, for example, I was in Idaho Falls uh, for a time and uh, Idaho Falls isn't really near anything else. Like the, the next large city that would be near us is Pocatello of, of considerable size. It's regional long distance to call Pocatello. It's the same area code, 208, for all of Idaho at the time. But I would not need to call 208 to call the number uh, because I was within the 208 area code. Um, long distance to another area code, uh, you're looking at maybe 13 to 22 cents a minute in the early 90s. Um, and then eventually all of the companies start standardizing on this 10 cents a minute thing. Um, and one of the reasons that there was a push for that is because we had something called 10 codes. Um, if you look up uh, phone company ads or whatever for the US on YouTube, which is going to be really esoteric, I know, but maybe I'm in the right crowd for that. Uh, there was a thing called 1010321. Um, and if before you call the phone number, you type 1010321, 10 you would switch to a new carrier and they would complete your call. Um, and uh, so this was supposed to be a big deal uh, that, you know, like you could suddenly make phone calls for 10 cents a minute. But in the early days, what they didn't tell you, or it was in the fine print while you're watching the commercial or whatever, is that suddenly your phone bill will have an extra $5 charge because you added a carrier to your phone plan. Uh, for, so for whatever month that you would use that code, it would be 10 cents a minute for, for all of your calls and no connect charge, but $5 one time per month. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting, weird thing. So what about the BBS scene? Uh, the phone system is maybe a little bit more advanced if you're, you know, uh, so, so calling BBSs would be much easier to do, much more popular. Not that it wasn't huge in your country either or whatever, but, uh, but especially in the US, uh, they've made it very easy to call other computers. So yeah, it was big. Um, and uh, it, in, in Nowheresville, Idaho, where I'm living, there are 12 or something like that boards. And this is uh, the population in Idaho Falls, to give you an idea, is maybe 50,000. So, uh, so that's, I, I think that's proportionally quite a lot of boards. Um, fairly quick standardization on PC boards, again, because of the popularity of the PC. Uh, you know, like, so not really, uh, you know, you see a lot of 8-bit boards or Amiga boards or whatever in other countries. You would not really see them uh, in the U.S. That's not to say that they didn't exist, just that, uh, in my experience, they were much less popular. Um, Examples of BBS software, if you're curious, uh, I, I, I saw and ran uh, Searchlight uh, Wildfire Renegade, and this is interesting for people in Baltimore. Uh, I met seven local Baltimore BBSs, and we did a roundtable conversation recently. Um, I always called this uh, I, WWIV, or pronounced it World War IV, uh, but, uh, but apparently everyone in the Baltimore region just says WIV. Uh, so I thought that was just an interesting, weird thing. Uh, I would also see a little bit less, but PC board, Spitfire, RoboBoard, Major BBS. Um, the time allotment, I think that this is pretty liberal, but maybe you have a different experience, but 30 to 60 minutes was common for boards. They'd give you a whole hour, even on a single node, um, which, uh, you know, people were very, uh, in Idaho Falls, since we had 12 boards, we would kind of call in multiple times a day since there was no connect charge you know, spend five or 10 minutes here, send a bunch of messages, maybe use a quick reader, uh, you know, call back later, check in on message boards, that sort of a thing, or, you know, blow all of it downloading files uh, in one go, which was probably me. Um, but uh, the primary distribution point of demos was BBS's, oh wait, let's do a slide about this. So how did we get demos in the US? Um, we don't have the balls to send floppy disks in the mail, um, you know. Uh, I think the difference in laws between countries uh, made it easier to skate uh, pirated software past your mail person, depending on the country you were in out here. But not so in the U.S. If you're sending something from the U.S. to the U.S., there are a lot of things that 
even though uh, the U.S. Postal Service has been deregulated from the U.S. government, uh, there are still lots of federal offenses and that sort of thing. People are scared of the FBI, so they don't do that. Uh, they're the minority. Um, sneaker net, computer events, fairs, shows, um, that would be another place to get them. Go to LAN parties with your friends. But largely, hmm? Oh, is that not a term I should add? Uh, sneaker net is uh, when you use these as your form of LAN. You take, uh, it's, it's a very complicated process. You find a demo on your computer and you copy it to a disk and then you use your sneakers to take it to the other computer. Um, and then you put it in that computer. You have to copy it off. It's, it's very long. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, VBSs are the way, I think, uh, in the US to get demos. Uh, I would call long distance to download demos. Uh, some people would blue box and get the call for free. Uh, and there were certainly you know, people with international contacts probably because, again, they were making illegal phone calls. Uh, you know, you really wouldn't call internationally to download, uh, you know, any software from the U.S. because it was so expensive. Uh, shareware distribution companies. I'm pausing because, uh, for dramatic effect, maybe, but also because there's this huge, big thing. You see it in demos. Don't sell our demo. If you, if you paid for this uh, demo, uh, you know, you've been had. Uh, that sort of a thing, but like, if shareware distribution companies had not distributed demos, I may not be as deep in the demo scene now as I am. Uh, so, uh, you know, if if we can be, uh, as uh, I suppose, as they say, a little bit woke about this, uh, I would say that that's a little bit gatekeepy. Uh, maybe you should say, don't sell this for a profit, but at least you know, sell it to get it out there or something, like pay for discs, you know, like, I don't know. Uh, visiting computer stores, I told you about visiting CompUSA uh, and copying it from the CompUSA. I literally showed up with, you know, like a, uh, or maybe I said, you know, if I buy a box of blank discs from your store, will you give me copies of what you have on this computer and whatever. Uh, they did, uh, you know, humor me. Uh, demo parties, if you were lucky enough. <laughs> We'll talk about this soon. So, and by soon, I mean now. Uh, let's talk about the US demo parties. So, how many demo parties were there in the US? Anyone know? Two people, one person knows. Guess? Uh, just, just guess a number of demo parties that we have or had. One, three, 10? So, I mean, well, okay. I do say U.S. demo parties here. Maybe I should say North American demo parties. I'm sorry if uh, this is a little flub. Uh, I was working on these slides immediately before the seminar. Shh. Uh, but, uh, okay, so we have U.S. seniors, and they existed, and we had a name for ourselves, maybe. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, some people have heard of Renaissance, uh, you know, and uh, we had some other groups. Uh, here's Nade, okay? Nade was in Quebec. Yes, that's Canada, not the U.S., um, 1995 and 1996, uh, we had pilgrimage in 2003 to 2005. Uh, I really, uh, uh, rewinding to Nade, I really wanted to go to Nade back in the day, but convincing my parents to let me go as a 15-year-old from Idaho to Quebec. No, uh, it's it's like it's like convincing your parents if you live in Poland that you could go to inertia when you're you know 13 or 14 or something, uh, you know. So um, so maybe not so. And unfortunately, uh, something very important for me happens in 1997. My parents decide that we're going to move from Idaho, which is Pacific Northwest or the Rocky Mountains, clear across the country to North Carolina. So now I'm no longer near pilgrimage in Salt Lake City, which if I still had lived in Idaho, I would have been two, three hours from a demo party that I could have made it to, but sorry, I don't live there anymore. So that was 2003 to 2005. I think a lot of American seniors don't really know about pilgrimage or think about it much. Block party would be the one that we fondly remember, uh, or in memoriam, Pixel Jam, that's in Ohio, I think it was Cleveland, uh, at Nauticon, and 2007 to 2012-ish, um, NV scene, 2008, 2014, 2015, uh, and San Jose, literally at the NVIDIA 
uh, you know, offices. Uh, I think originally as a post to game developers conference, um, they just kind of said, hey, let's have a demo party next door. Um, so at party, the longest running and still running demo party in, uh, it's, uh, I put Boston in quotes uh, because it used to be in Somerville, uh, but now I think it's actually in Boston proper. Uh, they, they have it at a, a maker space or a hack space called Artisan's Asylum, and the hack space moved. So, uh, so now it's in a different spot, but that's since 2010. Uh, that's organized by Dr. Claw, who is on the Discord, say hi. Uh, only one year later, uh, Demo Splash starts, and technically uh, Demo Splash was doing demo days uh, at Carnegie uh, computer club. So uh, was it around uh, maybe about the same amount of time or whatever and Demo Splash is still going. Uh, app Party is usually in the summer. Uh, Demo Splash is usually in the fall, October or November. I think App Party has announced dates and it's June. So, uh, you know, just to give you an idea. There is also Synchrony, which is currently on hold. Um, you actually uh, go to a place, or you would go to Baby Castles, which is kind of an indie arcade uh, nerd geek space in New York City. Uh, immediately after, you get on a train and go to Montreal, and that's where you work on your prod. And then you get off the train in Montreal and you show your prod. Uh, so I think it's kind of unique, but during COVID, that got shut down. So uh, I think that some of uh, Nom de Nom runs that party. Uh, and Nam, uh, some of the contacts dried up or something, and so we're, we're kind of uh, trying to restart that. Also, from 2018 to 2020, I ran MAGFest Demo Party with the help of some dudes from Poland, uh, the Riverwash and Zenium guys. Uh, so uh, we, we had, I think we had a pretty kick-ass show, all things considered. Um, it was a part of MAGFest, so it wasn't the main event. Uh, most people go to MAGFest to either hear bands play video game music or, uh, you know, it has a pretty gigantic uh, vendor room and uh, game console area and a lot of panels and presentations and stuff. Um, I also used to, spoiler alert, run MAGFest for a little while. Uh, so that's that, that was kind of my inroad to, you know, helping staff that and that sort of a thing. Uh, I don't know if you heard at Morning Coffee earlier, um, it, uh, notice that date ends at 2020. That is also currently on hold. Um, there were a lot of sort of staff changeovers and things going on. Uh, there was a thing called Friends of MAGFest where they overthrew their board. Uh, and so anyway, uh, there, there are a lot of things kind of different about MAGFest now. Hmm? Yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, not that MAGFest isn't a good show. If you like video games, I think you should go. Just don't go except expecting a demo party. That's all. Uh, so, uh, and also we did have some scattered demo content. Because I was the organizer of the event, uh, I would frequently try to inject you know, demo stuff in various places. So uh, here's why the US sucks at demo parties. Maybe you already know some of this. But uh, most importantly and obviously, the US is really big. Very, very big, and we're really far apart. Um, and this just kind of repeats in a lot of different shitty ways for us. Uh, there's a West Coast, East Coast rivalry in music, in uh, social culture. Uh, you know, the West Coast is much more laid back. The East, Post, the East Coast is a little bit more kind of high strung or type A or something. Uh, you know, and also because DC is on the East Coast, it might be a little bit more political sometimes. Uh, the true enthusiasts of the demo scene and whatever are few and far between. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't a lot of us, uh, but a lot of us as in, you know, the number of seniors in Germany compared to the number of seniors in the U.S. The U.S. is a much larger country and we have the same number of seniors, probably less. <laughs> and it's so much bigger that there's just so much space. Uh, computer education is poor in the U.S., uh, I shouldn't say it's, uh, well, right now it's especially poor. I think education is poor in the U.S. in general uh, and could stand to be better. Uh, also, there's a big disparity. There's a wide gap between, uh, you know, kind of STEM uh, schools and that education and that sort of a thing and just kind of your average school. Um, so some people are getting kind of left behind. Uh, nerd culture, I would say only recently was, uh, began celebration on a large scale. Um, and that might mirror your experience here. I don't know, but uh, you know, since 
the nerds definitely didn't want to run an event and you know get bullied or shit on or whatever. Uh, you wouldn't see this uh, in the U.S. as much. So altogether, it's too niche, right? Here's why the U.S. is better at demo parties. Uh, we have always had to do outreach, so we're very comfortable with this. And by com very comfortable, I mean somewhat comfortable. But I do think that uh, there is a little bit more of a sort of a, an exclusive attitude to a lot of Euro parties. Maybe not anymore as much, but there was at a certain point. Um, and like I said uh, before, I don't think that this attitude has ever been uh, a thing in the U.S. I think that we always wanted more people and we've always been inviting more people and trying to spread the word and trying to get more people involved in the scene. And this is something that just because we've had to do this all the time, uh, you know, uh, I really uh, actually maybe maybe a shout out in the form of uh, I hate you guys. Um, Vice magazine wrote an article called This is What Killed the U.S. Demo Scene. Uh, and a lot of people were like, well, thanks. We were actually just starting to see growth in the U.S. demo scene. But now that you've announced that it's dead, we're not, you know, like, um, you know, whatever. Uh, but uh, but here is here is something that's good. Our ANSI and tracking scenes were very large. Um, you know, I don't it, maybe they were comparable to what you had here, but com compared to you know us releasing demos and bringing intros to the scene and crack tros, uh, although we we did have a decent number of crack tros coming out of the U.S. I suppose uh, maybe they weren't as good, um, but but I think that uh, you know I've I've even just this weekend. Uh, talk to people that know a bunch of American tracker dudes. Uh, shout outs to Alexander Brandon, Siren, um, who I know personally, you know, um, other seniors that, you know, are famous, uh, not a tracker dude, but has written uh, many tracker related things. Trickster, uh, who I think many of you have met, um, also runs a vintage computer show uh, near Chicago uh, that I go to, and that's where we hang out. Um, so there's, there's something there, but... <laughs> That's about it. That's why we're better. Sorry. Uh, OK. We still love the scene, though. Uh, for, for all of the things that we have done wrong and for the very few things that we have done right, uh, the people that are a part of the scene in the US are very, very passionate about it. Um, and you can, you can know this because there are other Americans in the room here uh, that I have met. And you know, like when I went to my very first demo splash or whatever, you know, I'm like instantly trying to zero in on the people that live near me. I was like, wait a minute, where do you live? Let's hang out, you know, like uh, trying to kind of build up that, uh, you know, social link and whatever. We want you to come. We're honored to be included. Uh, and by the way, it's fun to travel. Even if you're going to the U.S., there's still some cool stuff to see if you just don't pay attention to the politics. So uh, come at the same time as a party or something and come and say hi. So... Uh, this is the end of my slides, but I thought that maybe um, there would be some questions, and I have, I don't know, a short period of time to answer some. Uh, does anyone want to ask anything? Did I cover your thing? For those at home, we're waiting on a mic to be turned on. Tap, a tap, tap. Yeah, yell your question and I can repeat it or you might be getting a replacement soon. Yes, on slide. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I've noticed that uh, American demo parties and, and general just things to do with the demo scene are a lot more accepting and have been a lot more accepting of uh, commercial opportunities, commercial, um, uh, I don't even know what kind of spin to put on it, but like Envy Scene is one example, right? That's a, uh, that's a place where you can see the, the commercial element, yeah. that's especially strong in the Literally US. Literally holding it at the NVIDIA headquarters. Yeah, so yeah. I've, I've found that to be interesting because it was, it was a very, very obvious difference between the U.S. way of doing things, demo party related, and 
the European way of doing things. I think it's changed a little bit in Europe, like it's become a lot more mm -hmm. acceptable, but I'm wondering if if that was noticeable for you as an American or if it, if it made um, sense. You know, to be honest, uh, thinking about more of the, uh, the the retro demos, so before NV scene, um, I do think that uh, that NV, NVIDIA's involvement with MV scene and whatever is unique, but I don't know that I would call it big. Uh, just to give you an example, look at Gravis and Creative literally commissioning demo sceners. Uh, so, you know, I mean, like, I would think that that would be a big commercial involvement, uh, you know, uh, so, I mean, I, but they're just different, you know? Um, so, I, I, you know, it, it wasn't really a standout thing to me, uh, is I guess what I'm trying to say. I think it's great, and I think that we should get more of that. Um, just because, if anything else, uh, these companies have a whole lot of money to spend, especially this year. Uh, we've seen some of their earnings reports, and uh, I would really love if they would kind of push some money into the scene and, you know, help us get out there. Uh, technology companies, especially right now, are doing exceptionally well. And I think that uh, without trying to sound too much of an asshole, uh, I think that they should be pushing technology education and involvement in technology things, even hobbyist technology things. Um, you know, it, I, and as much as I would even say, it is their responsibility to fuel this. Um, and uh, the, the, I will say one thing that I do see with companies uh, doing this though, they will, they will do this if you go to them and you say, hey, uh, some of our students might eventually become your interns and employees, but I think that they should be doing it for the greater good. I think that they should be doing it for, you know, to, to literally increase and improve, you know, technology education, not just because they might get a really great engineer out of the deal. Oh, yeah, we got. Uh, hi, I'm I'm Kudrix. I'm I'm doing outreach for the UNESCO Initiative Art of Coding. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In that sense, I've also been to the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. I go there for conferences. Uh, yeah. for my cool work place. Stuff. So I I met their director, mm -hmm. and I'm about to meet him again in April, uh, to organize some kind of demo scene outreach thing in the Computer History Museum. So obviously. If that would materialize, I would rely on uh, having help from within the U.S. I mean, you're East Coast, but um, probably yeah. You it's know a five-hour right flight so or a four-day drive for me to get to California, but I would love to join you and help. Yeah, yeah, okay, um, yeah. I'm not asking uh, particular, but if there is something happening, I would like to really be connected to the U.S. scene mm -hmm. and and kind of get the momentum also from there because I'm I'm coming from Germany and Switzerland and. Go there and tell them, look, there's a demo scene. You probably know that yourself, so why mm -hmm. don't we do something about it? So I'm, I'm, I'm happy keen to help on, you keen with on connecting. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. no, I'd love to connect. Um, and also, since uh, since you mentioned UNESCO, um, I'm I'm penning uh, the 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 reaching out to UNESCO in the U.S. so that hopefully we can get it accredited uh, there. Yeah, I, I think US, yeah. the U.S. the U.S. doesn't have uh, signed the UNESCO charter, so I think you you could not formally be listed on the UNESCO list because it's just not... Um, no? Yeah, I think, it, well, there was some kind of complication. I think we had the discussion, but we okay. can we can revalidate. But yeah, obviously... We, sh we should revisit. I yeah. would like to work with you on that because uh, my museum, Bloop Museum, uh, will have an actual demo scene exhibit, uh, permanent. Uh, so I want, uh, you know, I want that to be a thing that, you know, like we can be like, this is an important part of computer culture in the U.S., uh, and hopefully they would, you know, recognize it. But, uh, yeah. Cool, yeah. Let's connect afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had a hand back here. It's up. Um, is there something about the uh, attitude of U.S. seniors, particularly uh, in the olden days, where they, if not... Uh, the involvement of companies, but the, where the individuals were thinking more commercially in the way that why would I do something for free or just for the fun of it? Uh, and maybe rather go for something like game development where they could see the potential for making money uh, down the long term. Do you think there's a difference with, between Europe and the US in that regard? That's a really good question. Um, so I can't speak for Europe. 
Uh, but I can tell you that, you know, uh, people in the U.S. definitely do want to make money. Um, and, uh, you know, this is driven by various factors, one of them being if we don't have money, we don't have health care. Uh, <laughs> With, with exceptions, I'm sure, but, you know, uh, for example, me, I don't have money and I just finally got my health care packed this year. Uh, but, uh, but I do think that some American seniors would say, there's no money in this, I'm not interested. I do think that there is still a strong hobbyist coder scene in the U.S. that just doesn't care. Um, and, uh, and many of them are demo seniors who you've met, you know. <laughs> Um, but, but there are also just people that uh, I think there's a, if you look at the indie game development scene, uh, not everyone is an indie game developer because they will make money. I think that many indie game developers do dream of making money one day, uh, but there are still people that are doing it for the fun of it. Um, and I think that kind of applies to demos and the old attitude and, you know, that, that as well. So does that help? Cool. So kind of a follow-up question to that is, uh, I'm curious. So in Europe, it's, it's very easy to trace the lineage of, or the impact of, of demo scene, in particular demo seniors, demo groups, on various industries. So the game industry is like the obvious example of that, where you have many studios just popping out from demo groups. You have hardware companies. Like, it's very, very distinct. You can really trace it. Uh, I'm wondering if there, if it's similar in the U.S. If there are like these notorious success stories of demo sceners uh, moving to commercial ventures or having a significant impact on an industry, like do you get that in the U.S.? Um, since there were less groups and more just individual sceners, I think you would see it. You still see examples of it, but you would see it less. Um, you know, I mean, we can we can say, oh, look, Triton became Starbreeze. You know, future crew became remedy, and then just keep on going, right? But um, but in the U.S., we did have Renaissance, uh, and Renaissance produced uh, Zone 66, I believe, and uh, and a few other games. Uh, so you know, like we did see an example, um, and there were other seniors who who went on to you know produce games or whatever, or uh, ended up at a game development company. But they did, maybe they didn't start their own; they just became a known uh, coder at a company. Um, I feel like I did see um, a demo coder in Doom 2016 uh, in the credits when I was watching it. Uh, you know, I just sat with my roommate while he just beasted the whole game and we sat through the credits. I was like, hmm, you know, or whatever. But yeah, I mean, that obviously Doom wasn't written by demo sceners or anything like that. Um, so... Um, yeah, you know, uh, and I guess I, I use the example of Alexander Brand and Siren, you know, as well. Uh, we did see a bunch of musicians in the scene end up working on Unreal, the game, uh, you know, and, and working for Epic. So there was a little bit of, and Epic Pinball is another good example. Yeah, I mean, so uh, it wasn't exactly like it. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? There's a hand. Uh, yeah, it's maybe more of a remark uh, regarding uh, BBS versus uh, meetings in person. Uh, when it comes to the cracking scene of the 80s, uh, I'm, and I'm talking about Germany now, which had a big scene, uh, like you were afraid of um, mail trading, we were afraid of the federal uh, telecom service, which was actually the same like the postal service, um, because they didn't allow any modems to start with. You couldn't connect a modem to the telephone net, mm. and um, you you had this. Uh, they they called it data toilets, where you would put the the handle of a normal phone uh, to a modem, so you would uh, uh, connect through that. Um, but foreign calls uh, were hugely expensive, and uh, I think also people were more afraid of blue boxing here. While mail trading was very easy, you could easily get uh, what they call PLK, an, an anonymous post box where you could do your swapping and nobody would uh, actually check what you are receiving um, there. Uh, so that made it uh, 
quite um, attractive. And plus, of course, we were all close, much closer together, though you would go on copy parties mm -hmm. where you could uh, do the trading as well and the mail trading as well. Yeah, um, in the US, uh, you know, we had acoustic couplers. Uh, and the, phone, uh, the reason we did for, at least in the US, is uh, until I think it's 1982, I could be wrong. Oops, don't go to sleep. Well, I don't know that matters. But um, in, in 1980, or until 1982, uh, the phone company with your phone service would supply the phone. Um, and it was hardwired into the wall. Uh, there was no such thing as a phone jack with a phone plug. So, you know, you would have to use the acoustic coupler uh, until that point. Uh, eventually, they start implementing, you know, phone jacks in people's homes and that sort of a thing. And you would see there's one example of this kind of, it actually sort of looks like a, a Euro uh, AC power plug. Uh, that's, that's an old style phone jack, but those were not, uh, you know, nearly as common. And also your phone company would still supply the phone. Moved to the late 80s and the early 90s. You can purchase any phone you want. There's a phone jack, whatever. Uh, the, the early modems, like the, the micro modem 100, uh, we were really excited for those, but uh, direct dial modems with uh, Direct Connect became very popular very fast. Any other questions? I think we're coming right up on the hour almost, uh, maybe five minutes or something, if this is supposed to be an hour. Hi, I just wanted to know if you could speak about competitions that were outside of demo parties, like music competition. Like MC3 or something was something that Hornet did? Um, competitions outside of demo parties, like, well, I guess we do have, you know, coder competitions. Um, a lot of game jams uh, do things like that. Um, I don't know that, I think, I think actually maybe, maybe the more interesting thing, uh, since, since we don't see a lot of that, is that uh, the demo scene in the US is maybe a little bit more academic. Um, you know, not only is Demo Splash held at Carnegie Mellon, uh, but even at MAGFest, for example, when we did that, uh, we, have, uh, we had a competitor that entered multiple years. Um, and the big deal was uh, proving, uh, yeah, I mean, we certainly use uh, you know, math shortcuts and stuff we discovered and, you know, like calculus and whatever to make demos, right? But, uh, but what about like looking at interesting math theorems and then writing a demo about the math theorem? Uh, you know, that's, that's a little bit more what I'm talking about, that sort of academia. Uh, so we got an entry, I can't remember the name of it. You were there for it, uh, Ace Man. Um, do you remember... Um, in in the, the the full size or you know demo compo, uh, we had a demo that was written in Python uh, that that visually demonstrated interesting correlations about a math theorem or you know yeah I don't remember which one it is so I, I'm sorry in exam uh, in advance or in retrospect to the person if uh, she's watching this but. Um, Yeah, but uh, so so that is uh, you know we we certainly do have you know like coding competitions and that sort of a thing. Um, I would say the uh, the most popular coding competitions that you would see are like the um, the high school uh, competitions. Um, gosh, what is the um, oh, uh There's, there's a specific one that is standing out in my mind, and I don't. It's like the ACM or something like that. I think it's ACM it is, a, uh, is a national organization that you know, people will actually code things for and that sort of thing. And that's, that's an academic, not demo scene thing. Uh, we do see, um, yeah, SIGGRAPH, um, and you even see some demo content at uh, Usenix. Um, so, so there is that. Um, I, I think that takes, even, even with the, the very little demo scene or demo party 
uh, representation that we have in the scene, I still think it takes a back seat uh, to those parties. So I just got my time warning. Is that, uh, is that I'm off or is this last question? Do we have time for one more? Okay. Um, is it a quick question? I'll, I'll try not to talk so much. When you go back to Amiga and C64, um, maybe it was also a problem for like coming from NTSC and PAL competition? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, the NTSC PAL uh, problem is a big problem for compatibility. Uh, although for the Amiga, less so because you can choose NTSC or PAL on boot. Um, but, uh, but for the Commodore 64, yes, definitely. Um, yeah, and since we mostly had PC demos, not really a big deal there. Because I remember, like the one popular um, group from C64 was Eagle Soft. They did a lot of mm -hmm. cracks back then, but they were also like the scrolling was always flickering yeah. in PAL. So everyone thought they couldn't properly program a scroller on 64. <laughs> 64. Yeah, and it turns out it was 60 hertz. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs> I appreciate your support. I'd love to talk to you later. Fast Music is about to start. I have an entry in Fast Music. Um, it is a shill for my museum. Please listen to it. Vote for me. I want to win. <laughs>